or south to meet the challenge. And that's why we took the decision to change our name to Debt Justice, to help us better communicate who we are and what we do so we can mobilize more people to campaign in solidarity with affected communities. And though our name is changing, we are still proud of everything we've achieved over two decades, and we're gonna to continue to build on those. And we chose today to make the change to our new name because 24 years ago today, 70,000 people from around the UK traveled to Birmingham to form a human chain around the G8 summit that was being hosted by the UK government. They turned up to demand debt cancellation for 52 countries by the year 2000. And this protest was significant because it took the issue of debt from being a technical niche issue and propelled it onto the political agenda, both here in the UK and internationally. And from this point, it, was, it then took another seven years for the big win when the Global Jubilee Movement won $130 billion of debt cancellation for lower income countries, which led to significant improvements to public services, such as healthcare and education. And though this was an important victory for the movement, actually the structural causes that keep debt crises happening again and again remained in place. And so that's why we are still here. We continue to fight for debt cancellation to deal with the problem of harmful debts that are building up right now, while also at the same time pushing for changes to the debt system to prevent reckless lending and future crises. We're so excited this evening to have three inspiring, brilliant women on our panel to help us discuss the relevance and urgency of building a powerful debt justice movement. But just before I hand over to our speakers, I want to give a shout out to a few people who um, will be in this room this evening with us. Um, Jessie Griffiths, who is current, our current chair of the board and our board members, Cam Gill, Ruth Tetlow, Rachel Collinson and Peter Merson. Um, former chairs of our board, Stephen Rand, David Golding, uh, John Nightingale, who's one of our most committed activists and leads our Birmingham JDC group, uh, former director, Tricia Rogers, Abu Bakar, who's an ally from Sierra Leone, uh, May Buena Ventura, who's a good ally of ours from the Asia Pacific Movement for Debt and Development. So I just wanna say a few bits of housekeeping. Um, please, as the speakers are, are making their contributions, please feel free to ask questions during the event. You can use the Q&A function on the webinar. So I think there should be a button there for you to, to click on and add your question there. And then we will put these to our speakers when all three speakers have finished speaking. And just to uh, let you know about timing, um, we're gonna aim to finish this meeting around 7.40 p.m. Um, we know that uh, it's an evening, um, so people tend, uh, people's extension spans um, might start dipping after an hour. So we're gonna try and keep this just slightly over an hour, um, if that's okay. So first up, um, we have Jayati Ghosh. Um, Jayati is a professor of economics at the University of Massachusetts Amherst in the US um, and was previously, previously at the Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. She's authored dozens of books um, and has written more than over, over 100 scholarly articles. She's also advised the state and central governments in India, as well as other governments, and consulted for a large number of international and UN organizations. She's also a good friend and ally to progressive social movements across the world. Jati, thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening. I know I speak for myself and my colleagues to say that we are huge fans of yours um, and we've really followed your work over many years and we're really excited that you could speak with us tonight. Uh, so Jati, I just hand the floor over to you um, so you can give us an overview of the Global South Debt Crisis. Thank you so much, Heidi. And let me just say at the start how glad I am that the Jubilee Debt Campaign is still around as debt justice. I mean, you have been so important, so crucial actually in raising the concerns of the developing world in, in the broader global debate. And I just hope you keep playing that role and are ever more successful. So more power to your elbow and I'm very happy to be a fellow traveler. And, but as you mentioned, you know, this is really a very, very uh, extraordinary time because it's, the matter is more urgent than it's ever been. In fact, I hesitate to say it, but you know, this time really is different. It's, it's much, much worse than we have experienced in the past. And uh, it, it, when we look at the full extent of that problem, it can almost seem insuperable. So what exactly is it? First of all, I think we are actually on the cusp of a very significant global emerging country debt crisis. 
markets. Uh, I even hesitate to use the word emerging market anymore. What does that mean? Or even developing, because many of these countries, we are now being forced to go backwards. But let's say low and middle income countries. We are facing potential debt crises of an unimaginable extent and degree and severity. And this is coming to countries that have actually already had a period of about three years of fairly severe crises. Remember, before the pandemic, global economic recovery was halting and sputtering for most of the world, not for the rich countries, not for some of the advanced economies, which had recovered more or less because of massive injections of liquidity. They had got back to earlier levels of money income and in some cases of employment. Uh, in the developing world, that was not really the case other than China. And I'm leaving China out of this for the time being because, well, for obvious reasons. But uh, then you get the pandemic. And so not only do you get very disproportionate incidents of the disease in different countries, and we now know that developing countries were actually worse hit in terms of both morbidity and mortality. The WHO data makes that very clear. India was the, definitely the worst hit country with more, nearly 5 million deaths. But also, these are countries that couldn't actually do the same fiscal response that the rich countries did. So the United States, Europe did massive fiscal responses, you know, a quarter of GDP, additional public spending and, and fiscal stimulus. Developing countries between 2% and 6% of GDP, which in real terms translates into much less. So for example, the US spent $30,000 per capita additionally between January 2020 and March 2021. The low-income countries spent $2 additionally. That's the kind of difference. Yet these are the countries that now find themselves facing extreme and severe debt problems, partly because of debt overhang, partly because the moratoria that were announced during the pandemic just kicked the can down the road. It didn't really change the fundamental structural problems. And now we are seeing explosions of debt crisis. We are already seeing it in, in Lebanon, in Sri Lanka, in a bunch of other countries. The, the explosion of a financial crisis, a full-fledged uh, default and, and so on. But these are just the beginning. These are just a few, if you like, uh, you know, uh, straws in the wind of what is going to be a much, much wider and much more extensive problem. The alarming thing is that the IMF in particular, which is really tasked with dealing with all of these, is showing no new ideas. It's, it's in the same old trap, the same old, same old unproductive, disastrous conditionalities that insist on fiscal suppression, hoping that the private sector will come in and deal with it. The same uh, lack of ambition in terms of debt restructuring and, and, and getting together a mechanism that will ensure that uh, some of this debt is simply written off. And also the fact is that now the private sector is involved in multiple ways. It's not just banks, it's not just private banks, it is the bond market. And so when you have multiple bond markets at play and very important in the external debt of developing countries, even a restructuring is so hard to do because there's so many different players. And for individual countries, it's a nightmare. I mean, finance minister of Argentina can tell you what he's had to go through to actually manage to get the minimum kind of uh, restructuring, which frankly was you know, the absolute minimum that, that his country required. But for many other countries, it's simply not on the cards. So we have to think of international mechanisms. We have to think of defaults. And we have to think of countries getting together to default together, because that's the only way to put pressure on both private creditors and on the international organizations to finally get their act together and do something about this. But also, I would really insist, and that's why it's so important that you know, Debt Justice Network is operating also in the UK and Europe and US and so on, that you know, people in the North have to make this also an essential part of their mobilizing and agitation and demands. Because remember, 90% of these external debt contracts, both sovereign and private, are negotiated and legal tender in the United States and in the City of London and in Wall Street, basically. In, it's really in these two locations. And so the laws of the UK and the laws of the US, or rather of New York State, are what are determining the ability of all of these countries to do restructuring, to uh, delay payments, to do all of these things. So unless we change those legal codes, and unless we have a sufficiently popular mobilization to make sure 
that we have a feasible structure of debt, which enables countries to get out of this incredible crisis and quagmire, we are heading for, frankly, I mean, an absolute meltdown in global credit. In addition to that, we are also facing multiple crises, right? Everybody knows. There's a feud and fuel crisis, which everyone happily blames on the Ukraine war, when at least 50% of that price increase is actually profiteering by large companies and speculation in the financial markets. But we do have the feud and fuel crisis, which is affecting the rest, the, the uh, low and middle income countries hugely. We have the ecological crisis. I mean, in my own country, India, temperatures in Delhi were 50 degrees centigrade today. And 90% uh, of Indian workers are informal workers who have to go out and work, no matter what the climate conditions are. They are really at risk of death as they work. We have multiple crises. We have a pandemic that is still raging and new zoonotic and other diseases that are coming up. So we need now more and more public investment, global and national to deal with all of this instead of repaying creditors who have already been repaid well beyond their wildest imaginings, honestly, in terms of what they deserved to receive. So we need their justice. We need it now. We need action. And we really need much more mobilization in the North to make sure that these issues are more widely understood by people and that we can actually get a global movement that can ensure some real change. Thanks. Thank you so much, Jayati, and thank you for setting out that wider context for us. Um, I think it's really important for us to see the bigger picture um, and also, yeah, setting out the irrelevance for us here in the UK um, around the fact that, you know, like you said, a lot of these debt contracts are governed by um, either English law or New York law, New York law, and actually there's a real potential to push for legislation that forces private lenders to the table. Um, so thank you for that contribution. Um, Often um, debt crises can feel really huge, um, but at the end of the day, um, debt affects people. Um, and so uh, we are now going to zone in a little bit into the impacts um, on a country level um, and look at the impacts of the debt crisis in Mozambique. Um, our next speaker is Denise Nambarete. Um, she is the founder and executive director of Noeti in Mozambique. It's an organization that focuses on health and development communication, but she's also led the State Budget Monitoring Forum, which is a coalition of organizations that are campaigning for transparency and accountability around the debt scandal that plunged Mozambique into an economic crisis. Denise, we are so happy that you can join us this evening. You've been a close ally and friend of ours for many years, and we really value your partnership and your friendship. I'm gonna hand over to you now for you to share about the debt crisis in Mozambique and how solidarity from the global debt justice movement can support your resistance in Mozambique. Thank you, Lady. thank you very much. Um, before I speak about the impact in Mozambique, let me just give you a brief overview of the debt crisis. Uh, in Mozambique, uh, which is at the debt level is at tipping point at the moment. The debt levels have been growing for the last few years and mainly fueled by the disclosure of the high levels of sovereign guarantees that which were illegally acquired by um, Mozambique, Mozambique uh, public officials in collusion with uh, private banks, the Credit Suisse and VTB. These were largely non-concessional amounting uh, loans amounting to 2.4 billion contracted <laughs> illegally in 2013 in the commercial market with very high interest rates, lower maturities and higher refinancing risks. And this has incre in increased debt service obligations uh, to Mozambique to over 100% of the Mozambique GDP. So you can imagine the scale of the impact to the Mozambican economy. As the scale of these loans became clear, the IMF suspended its program with the Mozambique and all the other donors supporting the budget, the state budget followed suit. Uh, I'm talking about 14 donors since 2017 until 2022. Um, they have halted their disbursement to the state budget and their finally now in 2022 returning to the state budget. So during this period, um, this triggered a currency collapse uh, and led to a default. The country found itself facing a severe debt uh, budget deficit. The loans have thus led to an economic and social crisis and uh, cuts were introduced to government spending and consequently affecting drastically the already fragile uh, provision of basic services, public services. 
So these loans were arranged uh, by legal uh, lending international banks in collusion with corrupt private firms in Mozambique and officials. Uh, and the loans remain subject to various um, court action in the UK, in Switzerland, in South Africa, and in Mozambique. Um, and how has this affected uh, the, people, the people of Mozambique? I think they were affected uh, by this crisis in three fundamental ways. The debt crisis made the people of Mozambique more in debt to international creditors, despite not having benefited whatsoever from the $2.4 billion. Uh, the debt crisis triggered a microeconomic shock, which in turn caused currency depreciation, food inflation, and uh, a microeconomic shock, uh, shock, which resulted in implementation of very tight fiscal consolidation program demanded by the IMF and the donors which of course started progress with regard to poverty alleviation in Mozambique. So um, what happened is the government had to reprioritize expenditure and, and, uh, of, and definitely health, education, social protection uh, were the, the, the most affected sectors in, uh, as part of this uh, fiscal consolidation program. The debt crisis had significant impact on country fiscal position, has slower economic growth, high debt service costs, lower donor support, and a lack of room for borrowing shrank fiscal space. So by recommending and imposing a tight fiscal adjustment framework, the IMF actually unwillingly contributed to the country's worsening human development outcomes. Uh, the limited fiscal space and budget reprioritization contributed to low progress in the access to universal health care, to social security, to food security. And we can see this impact in day to day as we go to the health facilities, as we um, visit schools, anywhere you go, uh, poverty has increased tremendously. So the focus on adjustment and expenditure cuts as confidence building response from the government was actually misguided because it was political elites and governance failures that led to this crisis, you know, and contributed to Mozambique economic woes and not the people of Mozambique. So the preference for fiscal adjustment instead of serving served only to transfer the full cost of corruption to poor citizens, while the lack of consequences on powerful elites does not deter them from repeating the same misconduct uh, in, in any other place. Um, so what have we done as the Budget Monitoring Forum? We embarked since 2017 on a long and protracted legal challenge in Mozambique, in South Africa, in UK, Switzerland, in the US. And our motivation was very simple, to ensure that Mozambicans are not made to pay double, uh, a double price for corruption in, in our country. Uh, and finally, after so much pressure in 2021, Credit Suisse and VTB public acknowledged wrongdoings and violation of internal systems and procedures in the borrowing of 2.4 to Mozambique and agreed to pay uh, an, um, a fine amounting to more than $200 million, only $200 million to a 2.4 uh, scheme. Um, so I think um, in terms of, of you know, the, the, the role that, that we could have uh, in terms of solidarity from the global debt justice movement uh, and supporting resistance in, in Mozambique, I think there is a growing recognition that poor governance in many countries, uh, and especially those uh, in sub-Saharan Africa, is responsible to the emerging sovereign debt crisis in our countries. It's not only the fact that um, uh, financial centers like UK and, and Wall Street, they you know, create the conditions for this debt to, to be contracted, but the fact that we also don't have the governance systems and mechanisms to, to, to oversee um, and pro provide the proper oversight to, uh, to the borrowing uh, process. So I'm hoping that Jubilee, as it reimagines itself, it can support in addressing structural issues that give rise to debt dynamics. And I think there's so much we can do and a lot has been said by um, our, our previous guest. And I think um, in, in the case of Mozambique, we came up with a number of, uh, we, we have learned and came up with a number of things that we think uh, we could do with our partners 
For example, uh, private investors, especially international banks, need to be held accountable for their role in legal and responsible debts. We have seen how effective fines have been as deterrents to money laundering and terror financing. So a similar approach, I think, is required for international financiers in emerging markets. Um, I think we also have the opportunity to make um, the G20 endorse voluntary principles on debt transparency. Uh, it's a good start and I think we have the opportunity to have it coded into law to increase the effectiveness and we have to fight for that. Um, uh, Dr. Giadi spoke about the, the, the policy framework, um, I think that established that lenders should only lend, um, sorry, I wanted to say that uh, we should also fight for uh, a framework that established that lenders only lend to if a transparent and accountable government debt contracting process is in place, including scrutiny by citizens, CSO, oversight bodies of all government, and information about borrowing plans before contracts are signed. Um, and I don't think we have that in place yet. Um, in addition, uh, I think that lenders should only lend if they can and will disclose the existence of the loan within 30 days of contract signature, signature so that we, we have access uh, to all the information. And in that process, um, African countries or the global South should be supported in committing to accountable debt contracting process where we have parliaments approving the borrowing plans and such plans should be agreed uh, through an open process before contracts are signed so that we all have the opportunity to, to review and to, to um, uh, agree with those plans. Um, and I think we, the African countries are somehow uh, far from the, from the spaces where, where these frameworks, policy frameworks are designed. And I think we need to push for changes in the policy framework for borrowing lending. So we need to be closer to them, to these spaces. Most international loans, as we had before, are made under new work of British law. So tweaking the rules in these two jurisdictions will be a good start. Uh, and finally, I think that one of we need also to change the global political, fiscal, and the legal framework that supports irres irresponsible debt, tax evasion, and illicit outflow of resources from the global south. So while strengthening state institutions at local level to safeguard the collective interests of the rights of people um, in our countries. So uh, I think this has been learnings from the process we have been through. Um, and I hope that we can, you know, continue has that justice to support uh, our work and your work, and we can um, reach some changes in terms of the, especially in terms of the, the framework um, uh, for that uh, contraction. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Denise, uh, for your contribution and for sharing about the impact of this debt uh, crisis in Mozambique. And yeah, this, the scale of the crisis that you've just described, it sounds truly horrific. And um, just want to say that we continue to stand in solidarity with you and with the Budget Monitoring Forum in your fight for accountability and transparency of lenders, as well as the policy frameworks for lending that you've just described. Um, just also want to say that um, we've been working with Denise for the past five years to amplify the demands of the Budget Monitoring Forum. Um, our most and our most recent action, um, our most recent solidarity action, is to actually demand that the fine that's been issued by the UK government um, to Credit Suisse uh, for this uh, fraudulent and secret loans that were given out goes to the people of Mozambique. So, um, if you want to take that action, Eva is going to post up a link to that action uh, that you can take right now. Um, so, so far we've been hearing about the Global South debt crisis, um, but in recent years, uh, our work has expanded to fight for debt justice in the UK context as well, because we wanted to bring an economic justice lens to the issue of debt in the UK and build the collective power of people affected by debt to lead campaigns on the issues that affect them. No one should be forced to borrow to make ends meet. And yet we have an economy that is forcing people into debt just to cover the basic, their basic needs, such as food, fuel and housing. So our next speaker is Grace Blakely. She's a staff writer at The Tribune magazine and author of several books, including The Corona Crash, How the Pandemic Will Change Capitalism and Stolen, How to Save the World from Financialization. 
She's a former economics commentator for the New Statesman, and she's appeared frequently in the media, including BBC, T BBC Question Time and ITV's Good Morning Britain. Grace, thank you so much for joining us this evening. We're really thrilled that you can join us. Um, we know that you're incredibly busy and highly in demand. And so we really value your insight and perspectives on debt and how it's been hardwired into our economic system and extracts income from those less well off into the hands of the wealthiest. So I'll just hand over to you now, Grace, thank you. Thanks so much, Heidi, for that introduction. And it's great to be here with um, the newly renamed uh, Debt Justice. Um, you guys are doing such amazing work and it's been really, really great to hear from Jayati and Denise about um, the struggles that we all have to be supporting that are currently taking place in the Global South. Because as you've just been hearing, the level of the crisis that we're currently seeing in the Global South in terms of the outflows of capital that we saw during the pandemic and um, uh, that were piled on top of pre-existing debt problems for many economies are unprecedented, really. You know, the, the outflows of capital that we saw during the pandemic are bigger even than in the 1980s, uh, when, you know, the big debt crisis there, which precipitated structural adjustment and um, all of the, you know, that story that we're very familiar with. So it's great to hear from them. And um, yeah, just to be part of this, um, this panel and also to be working with Debt Justice to make sure that we are in the Global North lending our solidarity to those who are struggling in the Global South. And in fact, our enemies are one and the, one and the same, um, and particularly the City of London. Um, and the City of London, uh, which has been intimately involved um, but, uh, with many of these problems, both in terms of kind of promoting tax avoidance and evasion, facilitating capital flight from the Global South, and occasionally directly harming states in the Global South, as with those um, the London branches of those banks um, that uh, basically were involved in this um, lending scandal in Mozambique. That was the London branches of those banks, um, which is deeply unsurprising because of the culture of impunity that exists within the city of London, which also exerts a huge and negative impact over British society as a whole. <coughs> we, whether we saw this, you know, uh, in the wake of the financial crisis of 2008, or over a much longer time period where just very narrow financial interests in the city have dominated policymaking um, and have just led to wealth being sucked up to the top of our society. So those dynamics are at play both at the level of the domestic economy and at the level of the, the world economy. Um, and in that sense, you know, our interests um, as you know, working people fighting against um, extractive political economic systems are aligned in the global north and in the global south. And it's so important that we show solidarity to those who are really on the sharpest end of these crises and those from whom the most is being extracted and who are being exploited the very, very worst. And those are people who are on the, uh, the sharp end of these crises in the global south. But there is also a crisis here um, and it is important that we talk about that and recognize that because we need to make sure that we are mobilizing people and we are building support during this um, very febrile moment uh, to provide the foundations of a movement that can start to push back against these systems and a movement that is truly global in scope and that sees that we have uh, a greater commonality of interests um, with working people in India and Mozambique all around the world than we do with capitalists and financiers who exist within our own economy. Um, and we can see this very much with the debt crisis as it's manifesting itself in the UK. Um, so as well as that debt crisis that's taking place um, in the world economy. You know, the UK is an economy that has been built on debt for a very, very long time now, and not just sovereign debt, not even primarily sovereign debt, but private debt, and within that particularly household debt. Obviously, we saw an explosion in household debt in the run-up to the financial crisis of 2008. <clears throat> Most of that was um, ploughed into the purchase of housing, all that money chasing the same amount of stuff, pushed up house prices, created that kind of bubble that you so often see emerge in financial markets that was obviously supported by the securitization um, and uh, kind of insurance and derivatives policies that were being created by banks, particularly in the US, but also in the UK, and that kept that bubble going for so long. But ultimately it was all based on an accumulation of household debt in the US, in the UK, um, and in many other countries around Europe. When that bubble burst, that debt remained. So, um, you know, there were uh, uh, household debts where I reached about 150% of GDP 
in 2008 and started to decline after that point. Some of that debt had to be written off, but a lot of it simply remained on household balance sheet. So after the financial crisis, people were still very indebted. It's not as if all that debt just disappeared in the wake of the crisis of 2008. Um, and after that, it was very difficult to get the economy going again because there was all this debt and people really wanted to repay that debt because they were feeling very insecure about their finances. So that period, the kind of decade or so after the financial crisis, really the 15 years after the financial crisis, was characterized by um, this you know, big balance sheet recession, basically, which was where households had so much debt that they couldn't really be motivated to kind of consume more, to invest more. They were just trying to pay off their debt. But that was very, very difficult when you had the government imposing austerity, which increased people's living costs and reduced their wages. So we had the longest period of wage stagnation since the Napoleonic Wars in the UK after the financial crisis in the US. By 2018, the average worker was as badly off in purchasing power parity terms as they had been in 1979. We had this long period of stagnation in wages. And even though central banks have kept interest rates very low, even you know at zero or below zero in real terms, people couldn't be encouraged to borrow anymore because they had this huge stock of debt. So um, that was a source of vulnerability in the UK economy, even before the financial crisis, similarly in the US. And what also happened was that you saw these similar sorts of bubbles emerge, those links between um, capital inflows, lots of household debt and rising property prices crop up in Canada, New Zealand, some of the Nordic countries, um, where, yeah, again, you saw uh, a similar sort of um, financial crisis-esque model emerge, and also as well among some households in China. So there were all these vulnerabilities on household balance sheets before the pandemic hit. Then the pandemic hit, and suddenly, you know, when financial markets crashed, a big concern there, a big part of the, the worry that had led... Um, investors to pull their money out of financial markets was that what's going to happen when everyone loses their jobs when the economy shuts down and people start defaulting on their debts uh, because obviously you know you don't want to end up in that kind of debt deflation cycle where everyone's worried about repaying their debts so they start selling all their assets when everyone's selling all their assets the prices of those assets fall and then suddenly um, you know, the value of the assets that you do have is worth even less. And you start to get this negative cycle that mirrors the positive cycle of a bubble emerging. Um, that was what central bankers wanted to avoid. And we saw during the pandemic, they created huge amounts of liquidity and they acted as a backstop to many, many markets um, for debt. Um, so uh, in the US, the Federal Reserve propped up all sorts of, um, of private markets for debt. So mortgage markets, markets for auto loans, student debt, municipal debt. Um, and you had um, similar sorts of processes taking place in the UK where the central bank um, stood by to prop up corporate debt. You also had a, um, a moratorium on people's mortgage repayments. So people were able to avoid paying their mortgages back. And you obviously also had the furlough scheme most of that money from the furlough scheme, by the way, went on repaying debts or paying rent. So about more than 50% of that money went straight into the pockets of banks and landlords through debt repayments and rent, uh, rent repayments. So the government, governments all around the world really undertook these extraordinary measures to prevent those vulnerabilities that had emerged before the pandemic around household balance sheets from spiraling into another financial crisis. And the way that they did that was by propping up all these markets for debt and by acting as a backstop um, to, uh, to borrowing across the economy and particularly to household borrowing. But, and this is the critical thing, not all borrowing is equal. Equal. So some borrowing is more important than other borrowing. Some borrowing is more either important to the kind of functioning of the financial system, or it's politically more important to save some borrowers rather than other, others. So when you look at the way that government support was distributed, it was focused funnily enough, on the wealthiest. So whether you're talking about big corporations um, that were able to backstop their own borrowing, or whether you're talking about um, you know, mortgage holders who are able to um, avoid paying any mortgage repayments, even as private renters weren't afforded the same, um, the same relief, and those with lots of unsecured debt also face really, really uh, challenging times. Um, and this kind of built on a, a fracturing, I suppose, in debt markets that had set in after the financial crisis, because for mortgage holders, um, often who have uh, interest rates 
on their mortgages that are linked to the central bank rate in one one way or another. The period after the financial crisis, because interest rates were so low, it was really good for them, um, as indeed it was for the holders of most assets, because there was a lot of money through quantitative easing that was being pumped into the economy and that pushed up asset prices. So if you were holding assets, you did quite well after the financial crisis. Equally, if you were trying to take out a mortgage, uh, particularly if you already owned a home or you already had some wealth, so it was easier for you to take out a mortgage, you benefited from low interest rates. But those low interest rates often weren't passed on to other consumers. So credit card um, debt, for example, remained quite expensive. You had the explosion in payday loans um, and buy now, pay later schemes that often were associated with high interest rates as well. So there was already, already this fracturing in debt markets. You know, the poorer you are, the more you end up paying, basically, and the less you benefit from the system. And that actually was reflected as well in the way that the government intervened in these markets. So the wealthiest often were able to access more support than the poorest, who ended up, um, you know, having to continue to pay high rates of interest on pre-existing debt. And there were 8 million families struggling with problem debt even before the pandemic hit. After the pandemic hit, that obviously went through the roof and household debt started to rise once again and is now at, uh, I think, um, about 130% of GDP. Um, so not as high as it was before uh, around the financial crisis, but still very, very high and you know not as low as you would expect it to be um, at this point in the economic cycle. So that, again, is a really, really significant problem for certain people at the lower end of the income spectrum who are going to be paying high rates of interest on outstanding debt. So what all of this shows us, um, you know, and, and particularly now that we're entering into this cost of living crisis, where um, which is going to affect primarily poorer families who um, spend a greater portion of their income on buying essentials, food and fuel, and also who are much more likely to have existing debt when we're seeing central banks saying, oh, we need to raise interest rates now to curb inflation. By the way, that's not going to work because inflation is being driven by dynamics that are taking place in the global economy, not by people demanding too much borrowing. Um, but central banks aren't having any of it. They're going to raise interest rates anyway, and that is going to severely impact those on the lower end of the income spectrum. So what does all of this tell us, this whole story about the way that debt has worked in the British economy from the financial crisis through the last 15 years, through the pandemic? It really shows us the debt is political. Um, and, you know, this is a really th significant thing to, to realize and to think about and to account for when we are engaging in activism, because it's easy just to have this divide between like creditors and debtors on the one hand and either say that, you know, creditors are the good guys because they're lending money or debtors are the bad guys because they're borrowing money or we should feel sorry for all debtors because they're the ones that are, um, you know, being exploited. Actually, it's much more subtle than this because, um, whether you're a debtor or a creditor, your power within the system is shaped by your class position and your power within society and the economy as a whole. So you can be a big, powerful corporation and have loads and loads of debt, pay almost no interest on it um, and have corporations throwing more money at you. And that debt can be a source of, of power because it can allow you to buy up other corporations. Equally, if you have a lot of wealth and you're able to take out cheap debt from um, a bank that will lend it to you to buy another house, that's good for you. If you are a poor working class person living in a rental property with little savings um, in an insecure job, you will be paying a lot of money to take out debt that you probably just need to survive and just to make ends meet. And you will maybe living with that debt for your entire life. So debt is political. It's about power. The way that debt is used in our economy is about power. And indeed, the introduction of so much debt into our economic system initially with the neoliberal term, because household debt really started to take off during the 1980s. <clears throat> that itself was a political move. It was about creating these disempowered, um, indebted subjects who found it much harder to kind of organize to resist their exploitation and their oppression than they would if they were, you know, not in so much debt and able to organize in their workplaces. It's not a coincidence that like the decimation of the labor movement and the emergence of the indebted household took place at the same time. It was really about shifting the locus of um, people's sense of their own wealth and well-being away from their wages and what was going on in their workplaces where they could organize and demand better working conditions 
onto the household and onto their balance sheet. And then, you know, life became this game basically of, you know, how can I accumulate the most assets and the least debt and make sure that um, I'm able to kind of perfect my balance sheet over the course of my lifetime. Um, And that really eviscerated um, a lot of opportunities for collective action because it's hard to organize as a debtor you are your um, your relationship with your bank is pretty individualized as a household. You're relatively isolated, which is why it's so important for us to elucidate the political and social foundations of this debt crisis and actually to say this is a class issue. This is a problem that comes down to unequal, um, unfair, exploitative social relationships that exist with our economy, whereby the poor are made to pay more. It is expensive being poor. It's more expensive being poor than it is being rich. And that is, you know, uh, one of the reasons why, just as it is at the global level, these inequalities keep on reproducing themselves because you're poor, you're paying all your money in rent, you have to pay, take out loads of debt, you're unable to save to be able to accumulate any assets. And that means that when a crisis comes, you're pushed even further towards the edge. So the dynamics of debt are consolidating inequality, they're consolidating political disempowerment and pushing, moving beyond that, pushing back against that, really requires us to organize debtors um, and to organize um, people in broad, deep, cohesive movements of the exploited, of the oppressed, based on like, you know, class oppression and exploitation to resist that. Um, So yes, that means organizing debtors. It means organizing, you know, people around student debt. It means organizing renters and tenants, but it also means organizing in our workplaces Um, coming together as, you know, people who um, work for a living, whether that's paid work, whether it's unpaid work, um, whether it takes place in the home, outside of the home, um, to, yeah, basically make our collective voices heard and demand not just a different way of organising debt, but a different way of organising society so that the power to shape what happens is not just guarded very jealously by those at the very top. And I'll stop there because I think I've gone over my time. (laughs) there you go uh thank you so much grace um that's amazing whistle stop tour of kind of setting out the story of debt um in the british economy of the last decade or so and then yeah really drawing out the power dynamics about who benefits and the importance of organizing and movements thank you for your contribution it's brilliant um so we're gonna have about 20 minutes of question and answers now and we've got a few questions that have come up through the q a and some through the chat um so we're just gonna kick off with a question that it's uh, quite, quite a good, it's a general question and it's kind of connecting the, the, the local with the global. Um, so it's a question from Mark Hayward. Um, he says, how can we explain to people at large that huge debt is a bad thing for, for example, Mozambique, but does not automatically mean that all government debt in countries like the UK is equally harmful. Trying to minimize government debt in higher income countries means austerity. Um, So I wonder who wants to to take that question first from our panelists. Hello, can you see me, Heidi? (laughs) Sorry, I didn't see you there. Go ahead, Jati. Yes, no, thank you. I Yeah, just briefly, I'm sure the others will also have a lot to say about this. But of course, a critical issue here is whether you can borrow in your own currency or not. And uh, countries that can and do, and by the way, all governments, have some public debt in their own currency. And really that is not necessarily a problem at all. In fact, you can't really have economies without governments taking on debt to ensure the functioning because you know, tax, it's not like there's this pit where taxes come in and then spending goes out. Governments spend before revenues come in. And, and that's really how an economy functions. So the problem with government's debt in, your own currency is only if it is actually associated with a situation where there is a control on output somewhere or the other. There are supply constraints, which means that the economy doesn't respond to more public spending adequately, and therefore you can get inflation. That's really the only big constraint to public debt expanding in money terms in your own currency. But a lot of developing countries have to take foreign debt or are encouraged to take foreign debt even when they don't need to, either because they need foreign currency to pay for exports and and to do debt servicing from the past, 
or because it's cheaper, because interest rates are higher in most of the developing world. And that becomes a problem because you cannot then generate that money when you need to repay and you are forced to take it out of money that you could have used for other things. So that's the reason why so many low and middle income countries that don't have the privilege of issuing a lot of debt in their own currencies face particular issues and concerns. The idea that all public debt is bad is ridiculous. We, a modern economy would not survive without public debt. And uh, furthermore, it's also, uh, you know, the, the question of what becomes an explosive debt is a, is a different issue, which should be separated from the idea that public debt is an important and useful tool to make sure that governments spend on the things that matter for citizens. It's wrong if it's used only for military expenditure or for a range of other things, but it's not if it is actually used to expand economic activity and meet the needs of citizens. Thank you, Jati, for that. Um, I'm just gonna, uh, we've got some um, specific questions for the specific speakers. So I have a question for Grace, one for Denise and one for Jati. I'm gonna ask you, uh, I'll just read all three questions and if you could answer the one that people have specified for you. Grace, this is a question for you. Um, it says, do you think there's a fundamental problem in how credit rating is conducted? It seems from your submissions that people, countries or corporates in greater need are usually made to pay more. Um, Denise, um, a question for you specifically is, um, is it the IMF or private persons who are making these unfair loans, or is it the World Bank? And Jati, your question is, uh, thank you for the education, Jati. You talked about the need to undertake popular mobilization uh, buildup of debt and its perpetual impact to developing economies. CSOs, so that's civil society organizations, are doing all the weightlifting now, especially from the global north. My question is, how much do you value governments of the global south being integral to this campaign? Governments of the global south have usually been very reluctant to join for this for obvious reasons, but I think they are greatly needed for this kind of pressure on the creditors. How do you value their involvement? So Grace, if you take your question first. Yeah, sure. So there are definite and very obvious problems with the way that credit credit rating agencies work, whether you are looking at, um, you know, your individual credit score or the credit ratings assigned to entire countries, because what these credit ratings do really is they take something social and political, which is your capacity to repay your debts within a system that you have largely not designed and turn it into this quantity whereby people and countries can be ranked and ascribed different kinds of interest rates. <coughs> and it therefore kind of hides and elides the politics of debt and just says, well, you know, these are, are good debtors over here who are probably going to be able to pay. These are bad debtors over here who probably aren't going to be able to pay. So we'll make these ones pay a higher rate of interest than we will these ones. And at no point is there any analysis of who is making these decisions, these incredibly important decisions that affect the lives of households and the fates of entire countries are made by completely unaccountable, undemocratic organizations, often using very opaque metrics that can be, uh, that can reinforce all sorts of class, racial, gender inequalities. You see this when um, you go kind of go underneath the hood of the way that individual credit scores are designed. Um, and they are just, yeah, you know, created by these organizations, undemocratic, um, untransparent, and forced on the rest of the world, um, often with you know, dire consequences. We know that the credit ratings agencies don't do anything neutral and objective based on the role that they played in um, exacerbating the financial crisis. They were quite happy to give subprime mortgage-backed securities AAA ratings because they were making a lot of money from it. Um, but when it comes to you know, uh, assessing you know, the value, the likely, well, the likely credit worthiness of different countries around the world, different individuals within a particular country, um, they are much more likely to punish countries, let's say, that have um, you know, political instability. So a democratic process whereby someone might be elected, you might say, actually, we're not going to repay those debts. We're going to focus on our own democratic priorities. So these ratings are hugely, hugely political and they're completely undemocratic and they're completely untransparent. It really just shows you actually that this lie that we have, that capitalism is this free market system where power is decentralized and everyone has the chance to kind of make something of themselves. is just totally wrong. Actually, this system is based on a form of kind of planning by those at the very, very top who are able to set the terms 
of exchange for everyone else. And the credit ratings agencies are a really good example of that. Thank you, Grace. Um, I hope who was next? <laughs> it was um, I think uh, Denise. Denise's question. Yeah, Denise's question. Go. Do you want me to remind, do you want me to remind you? Are you okay? Hi. Right. Um, yes. Uh, so the question is, you know, uh, asking whether it's private personal IMF or the World Bank. No, yeah. it's not the IMF or the World Bank. It's actually uh, these are um, loans contracted by private by government officials. Uh, in collusion with uh, with banks, uh, international and also uh, private banks in Mozambique. So we have a tons of uh, irresponsible debt uh, contracted for infrastructure that is not needed, contracted to subsidize um, private public companies owned by the state. Uh, we have so all these responsible debts, actually the tipping point was uh, the 2.4 million debts that I spoke about, where um, government officials, once again, in partnership with bankers from Credit Suisse and VTB uh, contracted and designed the whole uh, project that on security uh, to protect Mozambique from terrorism and you know, attacks that were not there at the moment at the time. Uh, in 2018, when this that when this project was designed, and they decided to to borrow, and it was actually proved by the U.S. Uh, attorneys, and also now recently by the general prosecutor in Mozambique, that uh, more than 200 million dollars from this debt went actually for bribes and kick or kickbacks. So um, we have many cases like these ones, so that you. you so that you can have an, an idea until 2016, when the legal debt uh, case of Mozambique was published by the Wall Street Journal, we didn't know uh, the, the, the volume of debt that the country had. It was the first time that we decided that we need to put together in one single system all public and private debt that the country has. And it was surprising for everyone, the amount of debt that we had, and we had no control whatsoever. The parliament didn't have control. The government either had control. So it was a mess. And I believe with all the push from civil society, from also from the private sector, and um, some more you know, uh, champions in the government, we were able to have more a much improved control in the debt uh, contracted by Mozambique. Thank you so much, Denise. Um, Jati, are you okay with your question? Yes, I am, thank you. Uh, am I muted? No, I'm not. Okay, yes, thank you so much. Yeah, this is about the involvement of governments in the global south. And, you know, I mean, all governments are not the same, obviously. Some are okay, some are not, some are progressive, some are fascistic, some are authoritarian, some are totally, crony capitalist and you know very much in league with global finance. So I think it varies, but definitely there are some important allies among developing country governments today. I think the government of Argentina has been at the forefront talking about the stupidity of the current system. Uh, Chile now has a progressive government which is also much more aware of these issues. But you know, even unlikely, well, perhaps let me put it this way, countries that are in crisis uh, and are therefore also undergoing political turmoil. Sri Lanka is, a, is an obvious example, are more likely to be uh, willing to raise these issues. A big reason why governments fear it is because they fear capital flight. And credit rating agencies, just as Grace mentioned, they play a huge role in this. I mean, it's not just that they're behind the, uh, the, the curve, so to speak, but that they are actively promoting particular interests. And so credit rating agencies tend to gang up and downgrade governments that actually uh, talk about issues of you know, just viable debt levels, restructuring, uh, and so on. So uh, there is a global power imbalance, if you like, in terms of how governments can deal with it. Certainly, as we are going to see more and more of this explosion of the debt crisis all over, we're likely to get more and more governments willing to come on board and perhaps even join hands in this. Um, I just want to take up one of the issues that has come up in the chat, which I think is quite important. You know, one of the reasons why governments get into debt is because they're unable to raise taxes. And that, again, there's a global structure that is inhibiting. And I'm so glad Grace raised this issue of, you know, the enablers 
of the, the illicit capital flows of the South, because the same finance companies and banks that are uh, you know, creating these debt problems for the developing world are also part of assisting in the capital flight and enabling the illicit financial flows. So I think uh, in addition to, and that's again why we really have to get into the legal codes. You know, there's making sure beneficial ownership of all assets is something that is required of everybody in every country so that governments will know who is holding which assets where. Uh, getting tax justice in terms of multinationals paying the same rate as other companies, domestic companies, which is something that can be done, but the OECD, because of large corporate lobbies, has gone in for a watered down version that amounts to nothing. But ensuring that we can actually do wealth taxes by forcing country by country reporting, forcing national wealth registers that then are open for public knowledge. All of these are things we can fight for in addition to the financial transaction tax. There, there is a study by my colleagues, Leon Tindukumana and James Boyce we, uh, for Africa. And they have shown that just for five countries in Africa, the money that has gone out in the last 20 years is more than all the aid inflows and capital inflows of those countries. So, you know, really, when you think of the losses that are enabled by the same banks and financial corporations that are also forcing these countries into debt, uh, that I think is something we have to balance together. And these are all things that can be prevented with appropriate regulation. So part of the debt justice campaign, I think you have to join hands with the tax justice people also. It's very much part of the same struggle in a way. Yeah. Yeah, that's right, Jati. And I think we, did, we, we we see ourselves playing a key role in the wider economic justice movement because we, we concentrate on debt, but we are part of a wider uh, economic injustice. And we do support our partners in the tax justice movement, in the trade justice movement, fighting, you know, those who support those who fight against illicit financial flows. So, yeah, definitely a really important aspect for us to remember. So thank you for tackling that question that's come up in the chat, Jati. Um, we just have um, uh, five minutes left. And I was thinking we've got a couple of general questions. And so I'll, I'll read the both. The general questions out um, and then maybe each speaker can just choose whatever aspect of those two questions you want to respond to in the last five minutes um, that'd be great so we have a question from um, Anna Beraria Anna Beria sorry about that um, and she says um, our government has announced today a further reduction in the amount of funds for untied international aid going through the international agencies under the UN umbrella instead the funds will go directly to countries that will benefit the UK in terms of trade and influence. Against this background, what can we do to help countries that are already suffering from the debt crisis? And the second general question is, what would be the impact on the global south if Russia defaults on its foreign debts? So yes, yeah, so please feel free to uh, respond to any of those two questions in the last five minutes. Um, who wants to go first? I'm happy to come in on, um, yeah, some of these questions around aid, um, and I'll see what I can say about Russia as well. So, yeah, I mean, the, the aid budget in the UK and indeed in most countries has always been politicised. Um, we've seen numerous scandals, particularly with the Conservatives and DFID channeling money to organisations that have engaged in all sorts of, you know, there was one scandal with um, the UK government channeling money to um, organizations that were kind of pushing very like neoliberal um, free market uh, policies on, you know, various different countries all around the world. So it's always been a highly political thing. And as Jayati was just saying, the Global South loses far more in capital flight every year than we gain in international, than it gains in international development aid. The biggest thing that the UK government could do to actually support these countries would be the things that Jayati said. So things like registers of beneficial ownership, removing laws around banking secrecy and actually investing in going after the people who the government now claims it wants to go after because it's in um, the interest of British foreign policy, allegedly to tackle the Russian oligarchs who have been storing all their money in British property for so many years. And yet regulators find that they can't do it because they don't have the resources, they don't have the money and they don't have you know a lot of the um, regulatory and political support that would be required to actually take on these very powerful interest groups um so taking on the city would be the biggest thing that we could do but in terms of like campaigning objectives right now you know it's in the name of debt justice it's in the name of the jubilee debt campaign we need to be fighting for a debt write-off for 
countries in the global south. We had a debt moratorium during the pandemic that was negotiated by some of these big international organizations, and that just kicked the can down the road. Um, if we don't see this debt written off, I mean, ultimately, if we if the debt is written off and nothing changes about the structure of the world economy and the city of London is allowed to continue to do what it does best and Wall Street's allowed to continue what it does best, we'll see what happened after 2000 and the debt will build up again. But right now, the crisis requires us to actually push for that debt write off. That should be, I think, policy aim number one, even beyond actually uh, getting increases in and changes in the development aid budget. Um, so and the second question, what would happen to Russia if it defaults on its debts? Well, technically, there are people who would say that Russia already has defaulted on its debts because it's saying it's going to uh, do future repayments in rubles rather than in dollars, which is a technical default. Um, and there is, uh, yeah, some big questions around whether or not that does actually constitute a default. And Jayati wants to come in here. I'm sure you could answer this question better than me, actually. Go ahead. <laughs> no, 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 Grace, you're absolutely right. But I just wanted to point out that the US is currently defaulting on Russian debt. You cannot freeze the reserves of, an ex of, of a country. I mean, what, what are reserves? A country or a central bank is holding money in your banks and in your Federal Reserve and holding your treasury bills, which are your commitment to pay. And you suddenly declare ain't going to pay. What is that but a default? So let's not kid ourselves. European and United States act sanctions are effectively defaults. Now, they may not see that. G7 may be oblivious to this, but I assure you the rest of the world is observing this. And the rest of the world is now going to be much less interested in holding US and European reserves money. So in a sense, <laughs> these G7 countries think they're flexing their muscles, but I would argue they are actually bringing about the end of, a, let's face it, frankly, unequal global monetary order uh, without even realizing that they're doing that. Great, thank you, Jati. Um, Denise, did you have any um, final comments before we wrap up? Okay, that's great. Um, anyway, thank you so much um, to our speakers. You've given us such a rich um, and insightful contributions. Um, I think I can speak for us all to say that we've all learned so much this evening and feel thoroughly inspired to take on the fight for debt justice in solidarity with those most affected, whether that's UK households struggling with household debt or whether that's countries in the global south who are uh, facing the multiple crises that we've talked about this evening of a debt crisis and a climate crisis, food and food, food and fuel, price surges um yeah so thank you so much for joining us like i said i think you're all really busy people and i'm so happy that you've been able to spend this evening with us um if you want to stay in touch with us and get the latest updates and actions of debt justice um please sign up to our mailing list um eva's going to put the link up now and if you're keen to get a bit more involved um and uh take a something you know, take action with others uh, we also have an activist network um, so please, yeah, Eva, again, we'll, sign, we'll put the link up to that. So do sign up to one of those two things, our mailing, our mailing list, which will you'll get updates and actions or our activist network so that if you want to do more engaged actions with us. Um, at Debt Justice, we believe in building the power of those most affected by harmful debt, uh, centering their demands in public solidarity campaigns so that debt is no longer used by the wealthy and the powerful to extract and exploit people and countries. And as Grace said earlier, that the forces we fight against are actually the same. They're the same enemies, whether we're fighting, um, whether we're fighting uh, on the issues of domestic or, or, or global issues. Um, and that we are, and the, the and those enemies are, you know, wealthy governments, corporations, bankers, the city of London, Wall Street. And we know they're really well resourced, but we know that we can also win when we build our collective power, when we mobilize, when we organize. Um, we believe that no one should be exploited or oppressed or driven into poverty by debt. And we hope that you will uh, continue on this journey with us and join us to achieve this vision. Thank you so much for coming this evening and I hope you enjoy the rest of your evening. Good evening. <laughs>